about his time. Okay. So, so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's just put yeah, yeah. on. Let's go. Okay. Alright. We're going to start with uh, the next session. So the next session uh, is again a panel, second panel for today. Um, just like the first panel, it's a bit of an experiment. It's the first time we run this. Well, now it's the second time. Um, and this panel, uh, we thought we'd set up, well, we set a few experienced LLVM developers in the front of the room. And they're up to answer all of your questions. Well, all of your questions that are at least somewhat related to LLVM or its development. So um, to start off, um, maybe can each of you do a small introduction where your experiences are? There you go. So hello, my name's uh, Peter Smith. I'm working at Linaro at the moment. That's um, working primarily on um, uh, primarily on um, LLD. So I'm mostly in the linker area, ELF type area. So um, please, no complicated compiler questions for me. Hey, hello, I am uh, Jeroen Dobbelaar. I work for Synopsys. In the group that I work at, uh, we work on a tool called ASUB Designer, and that's a tool that allows you to describe a high level, in a high-level language, a processor architecture. And from that tool, we produce the hardware, the simulation, the software tools, including uh, the, comp the compiler. And I mainly work on the LVM side there. Hi everyone, my name is Nick Desonye. I work on Android's LLVM team at Google. Uh, and I work on building the Linux kernel with Clang. And I probably should also do a, a brief introduction for myself. So I'm Christoph Bales. I work for ARM. And I've been working on compilers there for about 10 years, mainly on LLVM and LLVM-related projects. So um, I do have one or two questions prepared to get the panel started, but I really want to open the floor for... Uh, for the audience to ask questions, otherwise, hopefully that will give the, the most interesting questions. So please do raise your hands if, if you've got any questions to ask. In the back. Uh, how is Asm Godu? So I'll repeat the question was about uh, how is Asm Godu? Uh, so Asm Godu shipped in Clang 9. Uh, so if you need it, it's there. We actually put out an RFC for extending it. So this is curious, the curious case of what does it mean for LLVM to extend a GNU C extension. So we actually have patches. There's actually like a constraint in GCC where if you try to use output variables, you can't, you get an error message in the front end. And there's definitely like ambiguous cases of like, what happens if you have two ASM go to statements that jump to the same label, but then they have conflicting output constraints. Like one says put this output in in one register and one says put it in a different register, right? And I uh, suppose you can uh, detect that and just error out when that's the case and then still write assembly that isn't overly constrained like that and support that. So um, patches are out and they're under review currently and there's still a lot of work that we're doing there. Um, but Bill Wendling is driving, dri driving that work. There's posts on LLVM dev for the RFC for that. Uh, and we'll probably have kernel patches soon that detect if your compiler supports that and then makes use of it. Cheers. So just a, a quick follow-up question on that, Nick. You said this is extending a GNU extension. Um, that seems to be similar uh, on topic for the previous panel also, how does LLVM and the GCC community work together? Do you have any insights for this specific one? Uh, I think... This is something where we've picked up on like uh, kind of the feature request on it. And I think um, a lot of the, the pushback on the GCC side has been, this is not something that's easy to implement. Not necessarily that it's impossible, just that it's not easy. And there are lots of kind of edge cases and things that we can think of kind of thing. And I think um, if, if we were able to um, show that it is possible and come up with some test cases and, and try to work out and understand these edge cases like conflicting output constraints, we might be able to take this back to GCC developers and say like, hey, we have it working with some constraints kind of thing, and then there's an actual important code base that may use it kind of thing, and that, that may help drive uh, prioritization to, to implement it as well. 
kind of thing. I think a lot of different features, like it always requires someone to take a crack at uh, implementing something initially and kind of work out the edge cases and, and find what's sharp. And then typically a, a second implementation to really work out um, interop between other things that the initial developers didn't think about. Um, and then there's always a question of, well, is this a priority or not for me to, to implement kind of thing? So there's definitely been like back and forth that I've had with GCC developers where I've said, hey, you know, as a developer trying to write portable code, it'd be great if I had has built in, right? We have has attribute helps write kind of more portable C and C++ code. If I had has built in, that would help as well. GCC developers got back to me when they got around to implementing it saying, oh, we noticed the difference between GCC and Clang is, you know, we happen to expand mac macros uh, then passed to has built in and Clang does not. Like, we think this is a bug. What do you think? I said, yes, this is absolutely a bug. I filed a bug, but, you know, it's not my priority right now to go and fix that kind of thing. So I think that that's the tricky part, too, is like, you know, if it's if it's going to be like part of the explicit language standard, that sets a deadline of like, when should we have this implemented by? There was a question here in front. Oh, yeah. Um, so I was wondering whether you can maybe tell something about, so when you have a patch for LLVM, so there's the system for co uh, with code on ownership, but sometimes it's not very clear who is the owner of a certain piece of code or who you need to review back uh, who you um, uh, need to ask for reviewers and how to go about finding the right people. And, yeah. Um, so the trying to repeat the question, if you've got a patch and you're looking for someone suitable to review the patch for you, uh, it's unclear sometimes who you should ask. And there is, uh, there's a code owner's file in the directory showing for different areas who the code owners are. Um, but even then, sometimes it's unclear. Um, and so on the code owner's file itself, I think uh, well, some of the code owners listed there, they're not very active in the project anymore. They used to be active. Um, and then for probably some of the code owners have just areas that are so wide that attract so many patches that it's impossible for them to just look at basically just everything. Um, after that, it gets to the point where somehow you need to figure out who would be the most active person understanding this area to be able to review this for me. Of course, if you're working in a team with lots of LLVM developers, developers around you and with lots of connections to other teams at, I don't know, all the companies, uh, it's a bit easier to know and understand uh, who to ask. But if you don't have that, um, it gets a bit harder. So if some of the tricks I sometimes suggest to, to people facing this problem is, first of all, Look at who last touched the code that you're touching. Does it, does, that person probably understands the code at least somewhat, uh, and there's a chance they're, they're still active in the code base. Um, what's uh, another suggestion? Uh, look for anyone who gave a talk on that in that topic in the recent years. Might also be uh, a suggestion. Or look who, for who actually reviewed similar patches in the same area. If they did good reviews in the past, that's a good sign, probably good reviews in the future. And then, yes, probably just like in any project, there are some areas where it's just there are one or two experts, and maybe they started work on a different project, and it gets hard. That's an awful lot to add to that. It, it, you're right, it is a bit diffuse, um, and it's not any formal policy on who can sign off, who cannot sign off. As far as I understand, um, I think anyone can sign off on someone else's code, but it has to be sort of in an area that you're known and familiar with, or it's kind of expected that you make that check. And you say the standards across the code base vary quite wildly. Uh, some of them have quite strong owners, some of them not so much. Um, quite often a good way to do things is just to um, look for areas where people have strong opinions. Certainly if you put a patch in somewhere where someone's got a strong opinion, it will probably get attention at that particular point. So often finding out who's, who's the sort of person you're likely to upset if thing, thing, things go around that particular point. Um, sometimes also IRC is a good, 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 thing, good thing to go to, say, um, I, hey, I've got this patch, can somebody advise me who, who can look at that, that type of thing. So sometimes you might find going on the LLVM IRC channel um, and going and asking on there can often help. Anyone else? 
question in the back? Or it's not a question, it's a follow-up. Yeah. Nikolai? Something that happens to work is if your patch is not a minor thing, you just present it on the mailing list, and if someone happens to answer, add him as a reviewer. Do you want to repeat that? Yeah. If you want to repeat that trick. Yeah, so this particular trick was... Um, um, if you see, if you post your patch to the mailing list and someone um, well makes themselves a victim, um, or, <laughs> then uh, then by all means add them to um, to the thing. No no good deed goes unpunished. I think in that particular case. <laughs> I, I will go for Nicolai. I know where we go because I actually have something to the doesn't go to thing. Okay. I don't know. And I had the one to follow up on the review. Yeah. Okay. okay. First the review one. Uh, you mentioned IRC. Now there's uh, this course as well, which is much more uh, newcomer friendly. And there's, you can ask over there, is anyone willing to review my plan? Okay, yeah, so the, the, so the comment there was that there is also a Discord um, serv, um, server. Is that actually on the LLVM mailing list of where to find that? I think uh, it's on the, on the home page. On the left okay. side, all links for IRC and okay. Discord is also Okay, there. so yeah, so there's also a Discord server that's um, potentially more beginner friendly. And uh, it, so on the trick of looking at who touched the code last, you can say like git log on the individual file or directory kind of thing, um, but not just the author, but if someone committed their patch with ARC, the command line utility, it'll typically say who reviewed the patch. So you can get the kind of list of reviewers who have reviewed T uh, people touching this file most recently. It's helpful. In fact, um, Fabricator no, will, when you put your patch on Fabricator, it will also come up with some suggestions already. Okay. I noticed. <laughs> Let's first do the follow up for a good lesson. Yeah, so I'm kind of interested in certain, like in, in evolving LVMR, right? At the IR level, the ASM go to is represented as an instruction that you call and a branch. Right. Target-specific intrinsics that can be called with this call branch instruction. Is is that something that you think people have problems with? Is that something that would there would be obstacles with in the current implementation? Just at the R level, obviously the backend would have to do something. Uh, so the question was, could we build additional uh, like higher-level intrinsics on top of the call BR instruction that is used in the IR level to represent uh, control flow? Uh, I can't think of anything. I think you'd probably help us work out more bugs in various transforms on call BR because it, it's been like a minefield and that's like part of the discussion in the I, LLVM community right now is kind of the overhead involved in adding new instructions to the IR. It tends to like, you have a lot of case statements in certain places where like the default branch is absolutely not what you want. And there's like, that happens all over the place. And so adding a new instruction, like a lot of things are broken and it takes a long time to find broken transforms. but. We've we put I've paid a lot of blood into <laughs> call BR. Like if you want to build on top of it, I, I, it's relatively stable kind of thing. About the community, a while ago, one of your top contributors, Rafael Avila, left a project due to something you could mildly call political reasons. As I said. Did this have a negative impact on the community? Did the atmosphere change? Do you notice that he's missing? Has he contributed so much? Um, I can on only give my personal view, and I didn't notice the difference. So, so uh, Raphael was a, a big contributor to LLD, I guess. So I guess I know, know him from those particular ones. And um, yes, did, did the velocity of the LLD project um, it would it have been faster if Raphael had stayed around? And yes, it almost certainly would have been. But uh, I think other people from the community have come uh, have come up and stepped into that place. And um, whilst we may not have been as fast as we were before, we we have we have managed to pick that up. But yes, there's always a risk in any when when anyone leaves the community for any particular reason um, that the project will, will will slow down. But generally, when someone leaves a hole, other people rise up to fill it. Is, is all I could say there. Anyone else want anything to add to that? Deal with LVM from the perspective that just 
distribution forbid me to uh, like have a rendered version of LVM, but LVM APIs change so much, and we have five years of like, branch support, and like it's a nightmare. And I don't know whether you have any experience. Like I assume you have sometimes experience like that. So if you have any tips on that, I would be very interested. So. I haven't had any direct experience myself. I know that um, I think one of our earlier presenters today, um, um, Alex uh, Denisov, um, I don't know if he's in the room at the moment, but uh, I remember him presenting about his particular strategy for one of his tools that had to support multiple backwards revisions of LLVM. I, I think in effect it had he had basically wrapped version sort of interfaces where it had various different ones. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that the, I think the community sort of, um, it has it, it, it follows the live at head mentality, unfortunately. I think it's one of those things you want to use LLVMIR. Unfortunately, you have pretty much have to subscribe to that, otherwise you're in real, yeah. it's painful. Yes, I, I think it's just one of the drawbacks of that particular model. Um, anyone else? I'm not my third parallel supported. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I think I can only make like a general statement that it's, it's a trade off between improving the system you're working on, requiring to break APIs, or being held back by uh, keeping stable APIs, APIs for, for a long time to come. So, but yeah, um, maybe my guess is that most of the people who contribute a lot to LLVM maybe feel the pain less because they, they don't have the use case of having to support something that was uh, the version from five years ago or five multiple versions at the same time. So, yeah. I'll try to summarize, Nikolai thinks we should do a better job by using uh, deprecated attributes. And if I understood correctly, uh, having wrappers so that the old API keeps on working, but under the hoods calls the, the new API, something like that? Where it's feasible. Where it's sometimes feasible. It's like, yeah. Sometimes you just can't do it, but yeah. Serge? Uh, the REST compiler actually uses wrappers to be able to The Serge remarks uh, the Rust uh, the Rust project does use um, wrappers to have some API stability, um, and the C API is also mentioned. Apparently, it's uh, less of a pain, but also sometimes you you do see that the same problem uh, popping up there. Question in the back. No, so, 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 the, so the question is, or, or I'll just try to rephrase. Um, there's a, a number of, if you want to get any code running, you need runtime libraries. Um, LLVM, for example, has OpenCL runtime libraries. There's a, a C runtime library project starting. And the question is, um, LLVM seems to be open to accepting more runtime libraries. You've got a bunch of runtime libraries and you want to contribute all of them. How do you go about that? <laughs> this is pretty much speculation on my part, but I, I, mean, I think a lot of it, it depends on, um, is there a large subset of the community that's interested in those particular ones? I think a libc obviously is of interest for quite a substantial 
portion of the community although that does bring the drawback there's a lot of different opinions on how to do said um, lip, lip, lipsy but i certainly think um if the th various run times that you've got reach a significant amount of people particularly some of the larger community members who can potentially throw more of their weight to to actually get some of that through so i think i think the answer is probably it depends um if if something is considered useful by considerable amount of the members i think it's it's worth a shot i think Isn't compiler RT? Uh, sorry, isn't compiler RT has separate like ISO specific builds? It does. Right. So I'd assume it would follow a similar model to whatever compiler RT does. Uh, have you talked to any of the compiler RT folks about this idea? I don't know who the compiler RT folks are. Hmm. Well, Git log, <laughs> compiler RT. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I think maybe just one last remark on that is the only way to find out is actually have an RFC proposal and, and see what kind of answers you get. Try to explain your rationale for wanting to contribute. Um, that's the best way to find out. As, uh, the, as Rust was mentioned, um, did I get this right? The Rust folks are just uh, basically normal users of LLVM? Or is there some sort of cooperation between you guys? Are you working together well. on some things? <laughs> so, um, from my point of view, it's not like the LLVM community is like a very cohesive, small set of people. So, um, some that, that, that might be close collaborations with, between some people in the LLVM community and some people in the Rust community. Me personally, I don't have a cl close collaboration with uh, Rust people per se. So, from my perspective, I would say it's more like they're users of LLVM, and probably some of the Rust developers probably contribute changes to, to LLVM. Um, but I'm guessing some people who are active in the LLVM community might see it differently. I'm mostly interested because I would like to know if there have been any changes to LLVM to accommodate uh, things Rust needs. Or have there been any changes in LLVM to accommodate Rust? Um, can anyone think of some? Uh, I can't think of concrete examples of changes to LLVM, um, but uh, the last time I spoke to Alex Crichton, who's one of the Rust um, C developers, um, he explained to me that they have significantly expanded um, LLVM's interface. They have like quite a few additional um, kind of methods that they expose in, in LLVM um, for whatever additional. Um, uh, you know, whatever their front end kind of needs additionally. And I said, oh, wow, like, this is great. Have you um, thought of upstreaming this? And he says, oh, of course I've thought of upstreaming it. I'm just so busy, you know, I never have time to kind of thing. So I think um, a lot of the folks at, at Mozilla were, like, interested in this compilation pipeline of, like, Rust through LLVM to WebAssembly kind of thing. And so you had people working on, like, WebAssembly backends and then, like, Rust front ends kind of thing. And then um, it didn't look like too much development within LLVM itself. Kind of thing. And I think um, since then I've actually, I think they've kind of picked up, like there's more people in the Rust community looking at uh, or making modifications to LLVM itself. Um, I was surprised most recently to find um, some folks on Google's Fuchsia toolchain team contributing to the Rust compiler kind of thing um, and, and kind of using existing LLVM experience to, uh, to, to extend LLVM for Rust. But Concrete examples, I, I can't give you one. Sorry. So I have a weird specific question about ASIC. Is LLVM used for the generation of the hardware or only for the integration of the accelerated instructions? Sorry, I didn't fully get the question. So yeah, the question is if uh, in our product, then, the LVM is used for the generation of the hardware or only for uh, the extensions of the instructions. Uh, so LVM is used as the front-end compiler, C, C++, uh, and it maps to the 
specific instructions that you have in your hardware. So it's not used to produce the actual RTL hardware or to do any optimi optimizations there. So it's not LVM IR to RTL, but it's C to your particular instruction sets that you have defined. I was secretly hoping that there was this open source file that nobody ever really spoke about. But <laughs> well, there do exist uh, LVM IR to RTL generators, but I'm not sure if they are open source. There are talk, there have been talks in the past uh, about such systems. Question. So the question is that uh, you can use LVM to compile code, uh, but you can also use it to uh, generate runtime, code at runtime, so JIT. Uh, and the question is if you can use Yeah, so the question is if you can also use uh, profile-guided optimizations uh, for the jitting. Uh, in, in our tools, we also use LVM as a JIT engine for the simulation. Uh, and we do make use of runtime information there. Uh, we are not using profile-guided optimizations, although if you can, uh, if you can get the, the numbers, the probabilities, I'm sure you can also uh, make use of the passes uh, when doing JIT. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just, just to that point, so I actually supervised a master thesis last year where we did that on the GPU, and it works. The main issue was actually getting the data back into the compiler. If you can just use all the code that LVM has for ahead of time um, yeah. profile instrumentation, just need to mess with what the runtime does to state to store the data and get it back out. Uh, for, for the two the two API, yeah. I, I think it's comparable to JIT, I think, in the, in the graphics world. I think because uh, graphics is always it's, uh, some JIT computation, JIT computation, which is better. Maybe one more example I'm thinking of is uh, there's been a uh, a few presentations at the dev meetings from how Azul uses the LLVM JIT in their uh, Java virtual machine, and there for sure they need runtime information to be able to optimize well. But exactly how much of that infrastructure is fully upstream versus part of their products, that remains a little bit unclear to me. But at least it shows it's possible. Maybe you don't have all of the necessary infrastructure in open source LLVM. Okay. So I, I was uh, wondering if it is possible with native LVM features. Right. Well, as LVM is mainly just a bunch of libraries, and in the yeah, main yeah, clang you can do this. So once you can provide actual uh, numbers of measuring uh, the, the number of iterations on, then you can just include those libraries and you can get it done. But it's, of course, extra work. Multiple processes, what right to the same file, 
except for you need to hack that out, and then it works. Any other questions? Maybe when we are talking about uh, JITs, there are two interfaces, the uh, MC JIT and the OF JIT. And uh, in other areas, LLVM is always uh, eager to have a, a good interface, and there is uh, two interfaces for years. Is, are there any plans to streamline this too? Well, there is ARC v2 already, so <laughs> we have three interfaces. <laughs> Makes the question much stronger. <laughs> I, I don't know, don't know too much about the JITs, but I know um, the the author of um, I think Orkjit and probably Orkjit too has just started a sort of um, a, I don't know whether it's a weekly or monthly sort of uh, summary of um, the progress in that sort of area. So this being a bit more on LLVM Dev, a lot more sort of consolidated reporting on that. So if you're interested in that area, be uh, be worth following that. I think the guy's name is Lang Hames. I think if you follow follow that, that would be be, be worthwhile to see what if there's any development in that area. Anybody want to go first? <laughs> it would be nice to not have a long tail of like compatibility bugs in like weird corner edge cases. I find myself working on a lot of those. I would like to get back to just traditional compiler optimizations. Like inst combine is like a nice pure classical. I don't know. Maybe it's not top three, but one of the things that uh, keeps on annoying me is that maybe the first question is who actually can sign off on a particular change. So uh, with the uh, most of the time, actually, uh, it's uh, I find it nice that there there's more of this consensus-driven model towards having decisions. But at some point, some discussions just keep on going and going, um, and having no decision seems worse than having either option A or option B decided and, and move forward. Um, I'm not entirely sure if there's a solution to that that's not worse than the status quo. Sometimes that annoys me. I think that's about quality. I think the, yeah, I think the, there, there, there has been some move, at least from Chris Latner, to sort of maybe try and open this kind of worms for um, sort of saying, do, how do we come up as a community with a sort of decision-making procedure to try and break some of the deadlocks? And I, I say I fully welcome welcome that. I think that's uh, hopefully as a community we can come up with something that over several iterations we can all agree with. But I, I think I agree with Christoph. The, the majority of things that I want from the LLVM are more community-based than technical-based. Um, I guess from a technical side, I, I would love that it didn't have a horrible experience for people with the default build options. Um, so the first thing you type, nin well, ninja or make, you end up with static linking debug with as many threads as you can use, and it generally blows people's memory apart. And there, there are a different set of build options that avoid that, but they're not the default, and we don't even document them. So lots of lots of questions on the mailing list about that. Uh, as far as actual features that I think hold promise in the future, um, I'm particularly excited about um, post link optimization. And I think that's being explored in a bunch of different spaces, including like parts of LOVM. Um, but a lot of it is kind of like the linker process has ended and like you've thrown away all this knowledge that the linker just accumulated, such as was there a relocation here? And like who really needs this value to really be in this spot, right? And, and, and I think people are kind of proving out that you can, like there's still performance we're leaving on the table, right? That post-link optimization can win back things back, but <laughs> For very, very large binaries or like certain 
large programs, there's like assumptions that post-link optimization just completely wrecks the binary and doesn't give you something that's actually runnable or usable. But I think if these were more tightly integrated into the linker, perhaps we may be able to like keep some of that information around and, and actually like do further optimizations that we're not doing today. Uh, I guess the, the question was like, what, what's the status on the, the original pass manager versus the, the new pass manager? Um, my understanding is that passes are slowly being ported over to the new pass manager. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that there's any deadlines or, or plans, but do you have something to say about that? Yeah. No, I haven't really thought about that. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to offer an opinion. Um, so, try. So, so, so you've uh, criticized the design approach where you create something brand new, built it on top, rather than gradually changing something that exists. In this case, LLVMIR. It demonstrates that it's useful, right? But it's yeah. Maybe... So. Um, I don't know in this specific case. Maybe that's the only way to demonstrate it's useful and that's how you have to do it. Um, maybe gradually MLIR and LLVMIR could grow closer together. It just becomes a dialect in MLIR. Might take a dozen years or more <laughs> to get there. Uh, so I, I would say, like, I definitely recognize um, people being bearish bullish or bearish, right, on, uh, on additional intermediary representations. I think, like, one of my favorite examples right now is this, this project called CraneLift. Um, that, that kind of, like, if you think, so, you know, LLVM has two different pass managers. It also has, like, three different instruction selectors and two different register allocators, at least two. Um, but, but the CraneLift says, like, Let's bypass like multiple IR conversions and like just go straight to machine code, right? And and we think we can cut out a lot of um, compilation time or time spent lowering by not spending so much time going between IR to IR to IR. So so I can agree, kind of from that that perspective, the 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 spirit of the question. Um, I think the point of MLIR where it really shines to me is is um, kind of converting to and from a textual representation and then doing uh, kind of your your dependency analysis or like use def chains or um, like certain compiler passes are really kind of language agnostic and it would be really cool to be able to like generate a compiler from a abstract description of your IR. We're, we've got 20 seconds left. 20 seconds left. <laughs> Does anyone have a, a 20 second question? Oh, oh Andre, 20 seconds. I just, I just 
fast manager. Yeah. There was an RFC on the mailing list a few months ago. Are we ready to switch to the new fast manager? Consensus was yes, we are. Expectation was no, we have switched, but no, we have not. As far as I know, all passes with an LVM have both interfaces, and porting is fairly straightforward. But no, we have not switched. There's so no we. There's no CE API. Huh? There's no CE API. There's a few other things missing. Yes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Uh, but as far as there's consensus to switch. All right. So personally, what I basically said the same thing that there were some backend bugs or bugs or something. I don't know. I'm afraid we, we have run out of time for this session. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the questions. Thank you, panelists. Um, and I would like to also request, if you have any feedback, given that we run this as a first time and as an experiment, please do share feedback either in person, email me, or on the FOSDAM website at the bottom of this session or every session you can also share feedback. Please do share your feedback. Thank you. Thank you.